My name is Benjamin Smith. I'm an instructor here at Grand Rapids Community College in the Automotive Service Program. Today I'm with Matthew Crawford, who is here as part of our diversity lecture series. Uh, Matthew's written a couple of books, Shop Class as Soul Craft and The World Beyond Your Head. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today, Matthew. Thanks, Ben, for having me. Uh, I was looking at your website and I noticed uh, that you have quite a biography on there. Can you uh, give me sort of a day in the life or at least a day in the work life of Matt Crawford? Well, I wear um, a few different hats. I wrote the, these books you mentioned and I, I'm also a, a, f a fellow at the University of Virginia, but I don't teach. I'm, I'm not a professor. I just go there and have nice conversations with people. Um, and then I have this small business uh, where I fabricate parts for custom motorcycles. And mostly what it consists of is uh, metal shaping. So that's putting compound curves in sheet metal to make things like uh, fenders and tail sections and side covers and gas tanks. Oh, great. Uh, all things that I would expect to be in a uh, shop class. Uh, I wonder, do you, uh, do you feel like I look at high schools and I see a, a reduction in the number of vocational education, as they call it, or shop classes available. Do you think there's still room in high school for shop class? I certainly hope so, and it does seem like there's been a little bit of a bounce back, I don't know, in terms of absolute numbers, but just in terms of a recognition of their importance. Um, you know, shop class was pretty widely dismantled in the 90s in a lot of schools. To make room for a computer class is one of the rationales you hear. There are a number of rationales. But I think we had this idea then uh, in the 90s that somehow we're going to be gliding around in a pure information economy and nobody will have to actually learn how to do anything. But um, you know, I think we're, we're realizing now that that was a bit of a fantasy. But it does seem like the skilled trades um, have fallen in the, the regard that we have for them. It seems like parents um, are anxious that there's only sort of one track to success for their children, and it involves um, you know getting on a certain uh, track and and staying on the the academic um, path. So um, so it bears pointing out that the skilled trades can be uh, a decent life for someone who's you know interested in that kind of work. Sure, and as an automotive instructor, I certainly agree with you. Uh, in one of your books, you mentioned somebody had talked about a, a growing demographic in that area of people who have a, sort of a four-year college degree and then decide maybe that's not the work they wanted to do after all, and they go back uh, and get some sort of skilled trade, uh, get into that kind of area, and we do see that in our automotive yeah. program here. Yeah, it's interesting, and maybe it's not that they just decided they you know, didn't want to work uh, in an office, but that they couldn't find work. I mean, you hear a lot of cases of um, just there being a, a glut of uh, four-year degree holders. And of course, a lot of people also start a four-year degree program, I mean, a straight sort of academic program, and don't finish it. So they end up dropping out just with a bunch of student debt and no, no degree. So it's, it does seem like Hopefully, we're starting to reconsider this um, kind of blanket prescription that everyone needs to um, to follow that course. And um, so, I, I'm hopeful that it's this is a moment when um, we're kind of taking a, a, a wider view of what good work might consist of. And I think the financial crisis probably contributed to that. Mm -hmm. Sort of everyone was forced to rethink a lot of things and. So if there's a silver lining, it, it may be that uh, we're more open to different uh, career paths. You know. Sure, and I imagine a lineman's job, we can't outsource that. Right, yeah. You can't have your, your electrical lines fixed in China. <laughs> right. Um, right, that's got to be done here. Right. Um, I notice you talk about uh, back at the beginning of the 20th century, um, the introduction of the assembly line, uh, and you started out talking about how some of Henry Ford's people, when he introduced that, just simply walked off the job and said, we're not gonna, we don't wanna do this if we're doing it that way. Yeah. Um, talk more about that and what might have motivated them to do that. Yeah, so apparently um, when, when automobiles first started being um, made uh, in the early days, um, 
mechanics uh, were recruited from bicycle shops and carriage shops. So these were people who were used to um, you know, having sort of full control over their own work and small shops, and they were sort of all around craftsmen and, and tradespeople. Um, the whole point of the assembly line was to break it down into the work down into very simple parts. And um, the point, of course, was to replace skilled labor with unskilled labor, because if you're just doing a small part, you don't have to really know that much. And this was really the beginning of a, uh, a trend that has continued right up through the present day of, of separating out the, the mental component of the work from its actual execution, its physical execution, and locating these in two separate classes, or the, uh, an engineering or, and management class, and then, the, um, and then separate people who actually execute the work. And it, you see this all over the economy, and it's crept also into white collar work, where um, a lot of people, even those some who have advanced degrees, find themselves reduced to mere clerks or just kind of following a script that's written elsewhere. So the point is that um, you know to be in that condition of just following a script feels pretty dehumanizing, and also. Um, you know, if you're not actually engaged in using your own judgment at work, that tends to correspond quite tightly with not being paid very well. Mm -hmm, sure. So it's this phenomena of genuine knowledge work being concentrated in an ever smaller elite. The point then is to find work that resists that logic. And you know, if you're an electrician or you're a mechanic trying to diagnose why a car doesn't idle properly, mm -hmm. you know, that can never be reduced to simply following a recipe. Sure. Always requires improvisation and adaptability. So maybe the definition that we use for knowledge work needs to be a little bit broader. I think so. Because if you are a welder or a plumber or a mechanic, uh, there's maybe there is quite a bit of knowledge work to go along with the hands-on skills with that. Absolutely. I mean, you're a mechanic, so you know, you know what I'm talking about. I, I don't know about you, I found myself m more challenged intellectually in the shop um, than in, well, than really any of the white collar jobs I've had. Now, I imagine you know, there's a big variety of different kinds of, of white collar work, and some of it is much, much better than others. I've had some of the lousier uh, jobs, so I know that it colors my view of these things. Um, but, you know, the, the job that I was able to get. With uh, with a master's degree was really dumbed down, and uh, it paid accordingly. It paid twenty three thousand dollars a year, and you know the, that's not what you expect with a master's. Degree. No, and the irony is that I'd previously made about twice that working uh, as an unlicensed electrician illegally, so <laughs> that kind of the light bulb went off at that sure. point. Sure, um, you kind of tied that. Uh, assembly line experience to a certain amount of consumer credit mm -hmm. um, where you see a, a connection between somebody sort of having these debts to pay off and saying well maybe this job isn't so bad then is that sort of where you were going with that? Well yeah I mean h historians have made that connection that it just so happens that the invention of the assembly line which as you pointed out sorry we never got back to your ori original point that people walked off the job in droves when it was first introduced because they were used to sort of being master of their own work and it was just so repellent to them to work this way. So at about the same time you have the invention of consumer credit, so the installment plan. Um, so it became normal to carry debt. You know, previously debt had been something that, um, you know, well Benjamin Franklin for example said uh, live frugal and free debt is something to avoid at all costs, but once it became normal to carry debt, then you it sort of unleashed the acquisitive passions. Um, so once you're on that installment plan, you don't really have the option of walking off <laughs> the uh, Sure, the you job. have to go to work <clears throat> to yeah. make the payments. Right. Um, so really, if someone were reading your, your first book, it's not so much that you are arguing necessarily in favor of 
sort of manual trades at the expense of more white collar work, uh, would you say it's more that you're arguing in favor of rethinking whether or not somebody would go into a manual trade and not just look at it and sort of put it in a box? As yeah, I think you, I think we have to sort of um, question these categories of knowledge work versus manual work as though they're two very different things. Um, so yes, yeah, not simply uh, sort of raw raw for uh, for the trades, but um, to try to give a kind of critical account of of the assumptions that we uh, kind of bring to um, to education and to how education fits into the economy, and also the larger question of of what kind of work is satisfying. And I do think. Um, that the real question is not whether you work with your hands or work in an office, but rather, again, whether the job involves using your own judgment. Um, okay. But it's precisely on those grounds that I think the trades are worth taking a fresh look at. Okay, so it's not so much a thing that we say, you know, maybe we should rethink going to college. It's that you want to rethink what kind of work we do afterwards. Yeah, and a lot of people, I think, are sold a bill of goods that college is the ticket to um, a secure path into the middle class. And I think that was true at one point, but but really isn't anymore. It remains true that those <clears throat> with a four-year degree earn more than those without, a lot more. But you have to kind of disaggregate these categories a little bit. Because if you compare the person who gets their master's ticket as an electrician to the person who you know gets a degree in sociology and is working at the gap you'd get a very different picture of their sure. relative earnings so if you take a more fine-grained uh, sort of look at it in that way which you rarely hear you know when these statistics are bandied about um, you know you get a more mixed picture okay uh, is there anything wrong with someone going to college say for sociology and then just choosing not to do that? Oh, so, you know, sociology is great. I've, I've actually gotten sort of turned on to sociology myself in the last few years. Um, yeah, if you can swing it, um, college is wonderful. Um, I think sometimes it makes more sense to regard it um, not so much as an investment in a career, but as a form of consumption. And as such, it's, you know, it's hard to beat. I mean, what could be more rich and enriching than to spend four years reading the great works, for example. Sure. Not because it's going to get you a job, because it may or may not, but just because, um, just as a human being. Okay. So yeah, this is not an, an anti-intellectual argument at all. Really. Right. I had a colleague ask me about that, so I, th hmm. I thought maybe I should let you clarify that so that... Um, well, there was no <laughs> misconception there. Yeah. Um, I want to kind of turn to your second book a little bit. You talked about perception, mm -hmm. um, and there was some discussion about how we interact with the world uh, and where we can't really necessarily, our perception, if we look at things on a, a screen, for example, two-dimensional pictures and things like that, doesn't tell us the whole story versus a three-dimensional um, yeah. experience <clears throat> in the world. Uh, do you think that with that kind of perception that, first off, to what extent is my perception my reality, I guess? Yeah, so when, you, when you're encountering the world through a screen, uh, through some kind of representation, you're very much at the mercy of whoever's crafted uh, the representation. And, um, you know, just, the, one of the real insights that's coming out of um, a certain strand of cognitive science these days is that we are embodied beings, which sounds completely obvious, but as it turns out, um, the way we sort of normally comprehend the world is by moving around and doing things in it. It's just very basic to uh, what a human being is, that we're not just sort of brains and jars, you know, like a computer taking in data and processing it. We, uh, we learn things by, by acting. Um, so, I mean, that, that argument sort of ties in, obviously, to the shop class argument. It's um, a question of, of what's, what's our most direct mode of access to the world. 
So a very practical kind of upshot of that is um, how we teach. And, you know, if you're, you say you're addressing yourself to a 16-year-old, mm-hmm. and, well, if you're building a tube frame chassis mm-hmm. for a race car, suddenly trigonometry is very interesting sure. indeed. Whereas before, you know, if you can't see the point of it, if it's just a kind of disembodied abstract set of, um, so knowledge, it, it just won't grab many people. Some people. More of a chore than something yeah. you choose to do. I mean, it's personally, when I was 17, the only thing that kept me going to school every day was machine shop. Okay. Um, and I went on you know, to do physics and philosophy. So I, I did eventually get interested in ideas. But at that age, um, it was machine shop. So I don't think we do a very good job of uh, accommodating that fact. Sure, and we see a lot of students who are really interested in repairing cars, Mm -hmm. uh, but they've clearly not done it before they get to us. It's perfectly acceptable, that's Mm -hmm. why we're here, but uh, it makes me wonder how many people can grow up now in a house where they don't have tools at all. Oh, yeah. You know, and they can't, where you don't have an opportunity to try that and say, do I even like this? Yeah. almost have to go to college or something like some sort of trade school if you even thought about it. Wow, so let me ask you about that because that's really uh, interesting. So you are you have people signing up for the automotive program who really haven't worked on cars before. Correct. Wow. It, it, very little, if at all. Yeah. It's, uh, so they come in and um, we really start right at the beginning. This is a screwdriver. Yeah. This is, yeah. yeah. We have to teach students sometimes that lug nuts can go on the right way and the wrong way, that there's a tapered end that yeah. centers the wheel. That mm-hmm. um, When I went to college, I went to college to learn auto repair as well, but I had done some of it, yeah. uh, starting with my dad's tools. Um, yeah. He was not a mechanic of any sort. But so what, what, uh, yeah. like what inspires a kid to sign up for, for auto shop if they haven't, is it just a random thing or... They just like cars, maybe? Yeah, it's more related to I like cars, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, and maybe just curiosity, you know, somebody is curious about yeah. what goes on here. Yeah. You know, you get in your car, and how is this going down the road? And mm-hmm. I suppose, to me, taking my bicycle apart, uh, I just started the curiosity when I was a much younger child. And mm-hmm. Maybe college was the time when they finally had the opportunity to chase after that curiosity. I guess, you know, if you're young now, the the entertainments that are available to you are so um, awesome, right, (laughs) Um, that it could be hard for reality to compete with video games and and all that. So, you know, being bored, you're not going to go on a a Saturday afternoon, you're not going to go out to the garage and start taking something apart maybe because uh, you've got Grand Theft Auto. I don't know. And that's where I wonder, you know, if somebody experiences a lot through, you know, virtual forms of experiences, is their reality actually quite a bit different? I mean, am, am I living on the same earth but a different world than someone yeah. else because I work with my hands? Yeah. Uh, and it's maybe that's something that high schools, as they shut down various types of shop class, maybe that's uh, a convincing argument for someone to keep some shop classes in their high school. I think so. I mean, um, not least because um, the more um, sort of reality, if I can use that word, gets displaced by sort of manufactured experiences, I think it, um, it's uh, kind of damaging to individuality. And by that I mean that, you know, these... Um, Experiences that are off, you know, offered to us through a screen and that are so intensely absorbing and hard to resist, video games, porn, um, whatever it may be, um, because they're produced on this mass scale, it means that we're all kind of having the same experiences. And so I worry about um, what kind of human beings that is forming because um, it, it seems like we're getting moved in the direction of, of passivity and dependence on these things. It's interesting when you say that we have these experiences that are all the same, where everybody has the same experience, because I know that when I went into the corporate world, 
around 1997, right at that time, it was getting to be a big thing to talk about diversity, and we're here as part of the diversity lecture series. So in one respect, society is saying, you know, we should respect diversity and we really, devalu we really value diversity. But in another respect, there's this other, other way of looking at what's actually going on that maybe we're actually limiting diversity. Um, yeah, not society. yeah, not in sort of tyrannical way, but simply because. Um, well, I, I make an analogy with fast food. So, food engineers um, figured out a way to create hyper palatable foods, as they say, by getting the levels of salt and fat and sugar just right. Um, and um, so, I think there's such a thing as hyper palatable mental stimuli. Um, that are hard to resist. I mean, just personally, you know, I used to read a lot of challenging books, and now I used to open a book of Aristotle or something, and then I, after a few minutes, I realize it's Tuesday night and my favorite TV show is on, and, sure. um, and there I am. So, um, so the point is that, you know, Cheetos can't really compete with broccoli, right? And sure. so these things that are kind of engineered to be so um, appealing, um, you worry about them sort of crowding out other forms of, of more maybe direct engagement with the world. Sure. I was on vacation over the summer, and I was in the mountains, and I remember very deliberately not taking my cell phone out because I was going to take pictures, but I didn't want to see it through a screen, and it kind of struck me that somebody was standing there and setting up an easel and was going to paint this scenery. Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea how the painting turned out, but I wonder to what extent did this painter care what the painting turned out like, or did she just want to use that as an excuse to spend more time in that mm -hmm. scenery as she did it, uh, engaging with the, the experience, I guess. Yeah, I think it's it's got to be a very different way of, of looking when you're painting. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I mean, art is so mysterious to me. Um, have you ever tried to draw, like, uh, from not life? Not since I was a child. I, know, I, yeah. I suppose I've drawn stuff. I know it's, as a teacher, I try and draw things on a, you know, on the dry erase board. And that's, sure. there's kind of a running joke with my students as to how those drawings turn out. So I, I'm sure painting something is a significantly different experience. Yeah, I took a drawing class and it was just so striking how hard it is simply to represent something. Because uh, you end up drawing kind of an icon of the thing rather than the thing itself, mm -hmm. you know. So the teacher had us draw a skeleton. Mm -hmm. And of course I drew what looked like a Halloween skeleton. <laughs> sure. um, but then he, what he did is he turned the skeleton so that we were viewing it like end on, you know, from the up from the pelvis, so it didn't give you, give you a whole different angle. So. Yeah, so then you don't have this concept of in your head of what a skeleton's supposed to look like, and then to try to just draw that jumble of bones was mentally exhausting. Quite challenging, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So it does seem like that to get back to our point that uh, if you're actively yourself trying to draw or paint, the way you're looking at things. Uh, there's a lot of exertion involved, a lot of um, a kind of attention that um, is very unlike taking a photo, I think. Sure, you can kind of snap it and go. Yeah. Um, when I first saw your, your second book, The World Beyond Your Head, mm -hmm. uh, we had a speaker here previously as part of the lecture series, Susan Kane who wrote a book called Quiet, and it was about introverts mm -hmm. and extroverts. Uh -huh. So initially when I saw The World Beyond Your Head as the title, I says, you know, she talks about the, the extrovert ideal and how, to a large extent, we expect people to be very sort of outgoing. And even if you look at, like, the Disney Channel, you see these people where you've got kids in, you know, junior high age kids or high school kids that have a band and they're like rock stars already. <laughs> um, we don't ever seem to respect a lot uh, the idea of sort of going back into your own head uh, mm -hmm. and having some quiet time. And, mm -hmm. and so her book talked about the importance of that. Uh, then I read your second book, and it 
it was not really about being an extrovert. No. Um, it was more about engaging the world outside your head. No. Uh, I was very curious at the beginning when you talked about all the advertising. Uh, I've never, I haven't seen the advertising in the bottom of the tray at the TSA station yet. You haven't. Uh, I always wonder who's who's taking the money. Is that a bonus for the TSA or <laughs> where that goes, or the the report card with the advertising on it? Uh, yeah. Do you think there's a way for uh, people? to say, hey, I don't really like this advertising and sort of shut it out? Can, can we control it yet, or is it out of control? Well, we're... just yesterday, I heard of a rare case of the, the ratchet going in the other direction. Um, so in New York City, the cabs have these TVs in the back that's just blaring uh, information and entertainment at you. And, um, and now they're gonna be removed. So this, this rarely happens. But often you can't turn them off. Everyone hates them. I mean, they're universally hated by the drivers and the passengers. Sure. It's a distraction for everyone. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a captive audience, you know, in the back of the cab. But it, it is striking how, uh, how pervasive that th kind of thing has become and how rarely, you know, it, it does go in the other direction of people managing to... Uh, get these things removed. I mean, just going through an airport, every possible surface, you know, is has been auctioned off for attention-getting sure. uh, purposes by people who want to sell you stuff. And it really, um, you know, it's the very idea of a public seems to have been eroded um, because these are, you know, public places, but you don't really feel like they're for you. I mean, if they were, you might be able to sit quietly and rehearse a remembered conversation or something, or strike up a conversation with people, which I find has gotten harder. Um, everyone is sort of buried in their own devices, in part, I think, in order to, to tune out the piped-in chatter. Sure. It's like this arms race of attention technology. We make different noises to get rid of the noises that we don't want. Yeah, and what's lost, I think, is the kind of public space that's required for a certain kind of sociability, just in encountering other people. Yeah, so it seems like the when I read both your books together, they kind of agreed to some extent with Susan Cain's mm. ideas that um, you know, if we're going to be in the manual trades, we need to be able to stop and think about what we're doing and have some quiet time, it sounded like. Absolutely. I mean, I just it's the condition for being able to think, um, to just to not, not being addressed. That's a good way to put it, I think. Well, Matt, it's been great speaking with you today, and uh, I look forward to seeing your speech tonight. Yeah, Ben, thanks, thanks a lot. It's nice talking with you. Thank you.